بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع هداه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه In the name of Allah, all praises due to Allah, may the salat and salam of Allah be upon the Prophet Muhammad his household, his companions, and everyone who follows them in righteousness until the last day. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah alone with our partners, and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's slave and final messenger. Last week, we spoke about hadith number 13, the hadith of Abu Hamza Anas ibn Malik. May Allah be pleased with him. That's a tremendous hadith wherein the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, None of you truly believes until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. And we mentioned some very important points as it relates to this hadith. We said that anytime you see a hadith like this, where it's, wherein you see the word la yu'minu ahadukum, none of you truly believes, then whatever is mentioned in that hadith is something that is wajib, something obligatory. And it is something that is, jazakallah khair, it is something that is from the obligations of faith. We also said that when the Prophet said in this hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la yu'minu, the intended meaning of the negation here is not the negation of the asl, the foundation or the root of iman. But what is being negated is the kamal, the perfection or the completeness of iman. Very, very important. And we said last week that there are two groups that went to extremes in this issue of iman, the issue of faith. Who remembers what these groups are? Al Khawarij. This was the first one. They appeared before the second group. And the Khawarij appeared during the Khilafah of Uthman ibn Affan. May Allah be pleased with them. That's when the sect started. Right? And they continued from that time. They gave Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an a very hard time. He even waged war against them. Al Khawarij. And we said that Al Khawarij, they make takfir. Of the Muslims, meaning they say about Muslims or about a person who does a major sin, they said, have that kafir. This is a disbeliever. He's not a Muslim. Right? So if you do a major sin, whether you lie, whether you steal, whether you commit fornication or whatever, those that group of people, they don't consider you as Muslim. And the opposite of Al-Khawarij is a group known as what? Al-Murji'ah. Al-Murji'a comes from the word Irja, right? And we said these group, these two groups have something in common. Two main things. The one, one thing is that they they believe that iman is one thing. You either have all of it, or you don't have any of it. All right? They don't believe that iman increases and decreases. And specifically with the people of Irja, the Murji'a. They don't believe that actions are a part of Iman. They don't believe that actions are a part of Iman. As for Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, then they agree. There is Ijma'ah, there is consensus regarding this issue. Go to any of the books of Aqidah and you will find this issue there. That they believe that Iman is Qawlun wa Amal, sayings and actions. Yazidu wa Yankus. It increases and it decreases. All right. <coughs> Today, this week, inshallah, we're going to be dealing with another very, very important hadith, hadith number 14. Hadith number 14 in the 40 hadith of an nawawi And this hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. We spoke about him 
when we spoke about hadith number four, right? This is the second hadith of his and the 40 hadith of Imam al Nawawi. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And uh, on the back side of your handout, we have something about his biography. But I'm going to mention something about him that I don't think I mentioned before about him. And that is, there is a hadith. It is in Sahih al-Jami'. Shaykh al-Albani declared the hadith to be Sahih. Wherein the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about Ibn Mas'ud. He said, Raditu li ummati ma radiya laha ibn ummi abd. Very short hadith. He said, I am pleased for my ummah with whatever Ibn Ummi Abd is pleased with for it. Ibn Ummi Abd was one of was the laqab, the nickname of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And we find this nickname of his mentioned in many hadith. One of them is a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, wherein the Prophet وسلم, said, Iqra'u al Quran min arba'ati nafar. Recite the Quran. Learn the Quran, take the Quran from four people. And the first of the four he mentioned was Ibn Ummi Abd, which is the nickname of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He mentioned him first. He mentioned Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he mentioned Mu'ad ibn Jabal, he mentioned uh, Ubay ibn Ka'b, and he mentioned another one, uh, uh, the freed slave of, uh, I believe his name is Salim. Al-Muhim, he said, take the Qur'an from these four. Ibn Mas'ud was from the Kibar. He was from the senior Sahaba. So much so that Ibn, Ibn Mas'ud, some say that he was the sixth person to become Muslim. The sixth person to believe in the Prophet Wasallam. He believed in the Prophet Wasallam. He became Muslim before the Prophet began to meet with the Sahaba secretly in the house known as Darul Arqam. In the Meccan period, before the Prophet ﷺ took the message public, there was a period where they would meet secretly and at, a, at a house. They would meet, they would pray together, and they would learn together, study the religion. Ibn Mas'ud became Muslim before that time. So, mashallah, he's from the seniors of the Sahaba. And mashallah, he's narrated a lot of hadith, a lot of hadith. He died in 32 Hijri. So if the Prophet ﷺ died... And towards the end of the ninth year of the Hijrah, Ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, he lived for another 20 plus years. Right? So he was around, he saw a lot, he narrated a lot of hadith. Your handout, we have them, uh, but I want to get into this hadith, inshallah. In this hadith, the Prophet sallam, said, as Ibn Mas'ud narrated, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم لَا يَحِلُّ دَمُ مْرِئِمْ مُسْلِمْ إِلَّا بِإِحْدَى ثلاث. إلا بإحدى ثلاث النفس بالنفس والثيب الزاني والتارك لدينه المفارق للجماعة رواه البخاري ومسلم. He said صلى الله عليه وسلم the blood of a Muslim may not be legally spilt except in one of three situations. The first is the married person who commits zina. The married person who commits adultery. May Allah protect us and you from that. The second, and nafsu bin nafs, a life for a life. And we're going to come back to each of these, inshallah. And the third, at-tariku lidinihi, the one who abandons his religion, al-mufariku lil-jama'ah, the one who splits away from the jama'ah. This hadith, brothers and sisters in Islam, is considered to be an asl, a foundation concerning ad-dima, concerning the blood. The first thing that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deal with, the, the first thing that people will be judged about on a day of judgment, not questioned about, the first thing we're going to be asked about is the salah. But the first thing that is going to be, the people will be questioned about as it relates to interactions between one another is the blood. Is the blood, shedding the blood. This is something, this is a big issue. The Islam uh, takes 
very seriously. For this reason, the Prophet ﷺ said, the blood of a Muslim may not legally be spilt except in one of these situations. The first situation is he mentioned the adulterer. There's a difference between adultery and fornication. All right? We should understand it, inshallah. Everyone should understand this today. Everyone who commits adultery commits fornication, but not everyone who fornicates commits adultery. Adultery is when someone who was married or someone who was married previously. They may not be married right now, but they were married previously. If this person commits fornication, meaning lay with someone who is not his wife or her husband, right? That's called adultery. As for fornication, then that is to lay with someone that is not your wife, but you're not married and you never were married before. Is that clear? There's two different punishments for these, these people. And, this, and of course, when we talk in the, about this hadith, we have to put we have to qualify it and we have to put a disclaimer. We're not we're not saying or promoting that here in the United States of America, if someone does this, you go and lash him and you go and stone him. All right? This is done. In the land of the Muslims, where the Muslims have authority. And it, even there, it's not done by anyone and everyone. It's done in the proper way. They have, a, they have something called the Qadi, the judge, the courts. Right? This is where those issues are settled. Islam is not a religion, a vigilantism. Everybody just go and do what he's going to do. No, we don't have that in Islam. So, with regard to the adultery, then... Uh, Allah has told us in the Quran, there's two ways for us to know someone committed adultery. One is where the person comes to the, the leader, the judge, and says, I committed the adultery. Some of the Sahaba did that. Right? A man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, O Messenger of Allah, I committed zina. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Maybe, maybe you just kissed the woman. Maybe you didn't. Go all the way. Right? What does that mean? The Prophet ﷺ was looking for an excuse for this man. Very different from many of us today. People today, they just want to ruin a person's, his whole life, you know, his reputation, everything. He did it. I saw him. I heard. It was told. No. In Islam, this is the one way. Someone comes and says that he did it. And another way is where you have four witnesses. Four. Not two. Not three. But four. And they all have to have seen everything from A to Z. Why did Islam make it like that? Because Islam doesn't, first of all, we don't want this type of stuff. Uh, we don't want people just going around saying so-and-so did this and did that. That's not uh, what Islam encourages. All right. Uh, so the person who commits adultery, the punishment for them According to many of the scholars, the Jumhur and, and, and Ala Ra'sihim Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, is that this person should be lashed and stoned. Lashed and stoned. As for the one who just committed fornication, he's not an adulterer, they say lashing only. They say lashing only. And Ali radiallahu an, he did this during his rule. A lady came to him and confessed. Same thing. She said, I committed zina. And Ali radiallahu anh, said, no, maybe you just saw that in a dream. Maybe you had a dream and you saw that. Maybe you really didn't do it, you know. Same way the Prophet sallallahu was looking for an excuse for the man who came and confessed. Confess. So this shows you what? Islam, zina, fornication is something very serious. And we said before that there are something called maqasid al-sharia, objectives of the sharia. And they are five or six. Some say six. And one of them is the preservation of the honor, and one of them is the preservation of the lineage. The lineage. This is why Islam made it obligatory. If a man wants to have relations with a woman or vice versa, a woman is going to be intimate with a man, they have to be married. And under the cover of nikah, marriage. And, and in doing so, we preserve the lineage. When you have people committing zina, fornication, and it becomes widespread in the society, it has many, many evil consequences. 
One of them is the spread of STDs, like what we see right here in the United States. They say one out of every four Americans has herpes. One out of every four. There's so many different STDs. We used to be worried about HIV. That's not the, that's not the one that, that you can live comfortably with that now. They have all kinds of stuff, stuff that can really make your life miserable, right? STDs. And this, the Prophet ﷺ said in one hadith, never does zina become widespread in the society except that Allah will allow those people to experience diseases which their forefathers never experienced. We see that here. That's one consequence. Another consequence of fornication in the society is you don't know who the father is. One, one uh, family, one household, right? You got four, five children, four or five different fathers. And in some cases, they don't even know who the father is. <laughs> SubhanAllah. In Islam, when a, a man wants to divorce his wife, he has to do so when she is in a state of purity. Right? And even when he does divorce her, she has to wait three cycles. Right? Why is that? Because Islam, obviously, I mean, there's a number of benefits in that. One of them is this possibility that they may rectify and, and stay together. But another very important thing is, is that if she's pregnant, it will come to light during that time. There won't be no ambiguity. Huh? Was who's the father? Right? Another evil consequence of zina is that children who grow up in societies where without the, the two parents in the household, this is proven fact. Studies have been done to show that these children oftentimes grow up because they don't have the love and affection of their two parents. They have resentment. Adawa. Resentment. Yahamakallah. They have resentment towards their society. Not just one or both of their parents, but their society. It's no coincidence that many of the people that are incarcerated in prisons right now are the children of zina, children of fornication. They grow up very unhappy and bitter. And there's a lot of evils that come out of that. So Islam prohibits zina and uh, it is so serious that we have this head, this punishment that Allah legislated for the adulterer and the adulteress, as well as for the fornicator and the and, and, and the woman who commits fornication. The second scenario wherein a person's blood is made halal in Islam is a nafsu bin nafs, a life for a life. This is called in the Quran what? Al Qisas. Al Qisas. I remember when Sheikh Mukbil Rahimahullah he was still alive. And uh, he visited Saudi towards the end of his life. It's a very famous trip. And he actually did a lot of recordings. People came to visit him during his time. <clears throat> and he said about his experience there, he said that for the first time in years, I left my hotel and walked outside without worrying or feeling uh, any concerned about my safety or my well-being. Because in Yemen, he walked with his security guard. The security guard is with him. He said, I went outside and I didn't have any need for that, any concern. And then he started praising that country. He said, and this is from the consequences, from the, the fruits of establishing and ruling with the Sharia. Right? Yes, there will always be people who will criticize Saudi and say they have this, they have that. I mean, there's no country on the face of the earth that doesn't have their share of things. But nevertheless, even with all of that, there's so much khayr there. And, and anyone who has been there, you have witnessed it. I was in uh, Saudi just a couple of weeks ago, and I remember leaving the airport. And I got in the car with anybody. A guy was like, hey, you want to go to Mecca? I said, yeah. He wasn't even an official cab driver. My daughter was like, Dad, are you, you think this is okay? I said, oh, yeah, we good. We good. This is okay. Adi, this is natural here. It's the truth. You can just raise your hand. Anyone come pick you up. You don't worry about your safety or your well-being. You do not. Right? Because what? They have, mashallah, in that place, they have sharia. They have, the, they have laws. They have things that they implement. Mashallah. And they don't play. They don't play with them things over there. You know? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, 
كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْقِصَاصِ فِي الْقَتْلَى O you who believe, prescribed for you is legal retribution for those murdered. And Allah says in the verse after, وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِصَاصِ حَيَا Verily, and there is for you in قِصَاص or legal retribution, حَيَا Life يَا أُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ O you of understanding. Huh? Allah says in قِصَاص Legal retribution, there is haya. Some people criticize Saudi. They say they're so cruel. They, when someone is caught for a serious offense over there, once you found guilty, they don't have like here in America where people sit in prison, what they call, uh, you got hundreds of thousands of people sitting in prison on taxpayers' dollars for the rest of their lives. You work hard for your money and they're in prison living comfortably with your dollars no over there they have there's three places in Saudi where they carry out the the public stone and one of them is Jeddah Jeddah is one of them and it's and it's in the middle of the day anyone can come see it you go on YouTube and put put in uh beheading <laughs> you can see it they show everything even the kid you can bring your kid and let him go see it yeah, you kill someone, you murder someone, it's very serious. You rape someone, you do billah, evil things to little children, you see how they deal with you in that society. What's the benefit? The benefit is, mashallah, you can leave your wallet and your keys and your Mercedes Benz and go inside the mall for two hours and come back and find what? Your wallet and your keys. No one's going to come rob you. No one's going to pull guns out on you and and there, that's something unheard of. If you hear, if you hear about it, it's something big. <laughs> I was in there in maybe 2015. Some man he he raped a little girl, and 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 they when he did it and it reached the public, the imams on Jumu'ah, all the imams making du'a, oh Allah, aid the authorities and catch this man. <laughs> they caught this man. Khalas, done. He's no more. Huh? Some people say that's cruel. No, it's not cruel. That's mercy. That's mercy. It's mercy not only for the, the, the family, it's mercy for the society. Sometimes in order for the flowers and the fruits to grow nicely, you got to what? You got to cut the weeds. You got to eliminate certain things in order for things to go nicely. Here in our country, we play. This is a country for criminals. We play with criminals. You ever heard, you know what the word recidivism means? Recidivism, recidivism means someone who went to prison, who went home and came back. This is the only country in the world that has that problem. They don't have it even in Russia. You go to prison in Russia and you go home. If you go home, you never come back. You got the lesson. You got the message. Here, oh man, I know people. I know people personally. A guy told me. He said. Mom, I don't have nothing. I don't have no family on the outside. I don't have nothing going for myself. So I strategically, in the fall, I do a crime, just enough to get me six, seven months to a year. And now I know that at least in the winter time, I have food. What they say, three hots and a cot. I got my breakfast, my lunch, my dinner, and uh, I, my medical expenses is taken care of. Yeah, hello. I'm not lying. Listen, one guy said to me. He looked at me with this big plate of food in his hand and he says, MashaAllah, Imam, God bless America. He said, God bless America. Where in the world can I do what I did and live like this? <laughs> That's what he said. huh? Because we play with the criminals here. That's why we have recidivism. Do you know the U.S. population is only 3% of the global population? We only make up 3% of the whole world. But we have the overwhelming majority of incarcerated people in the world. We have the overwhelming majority of incarcerated people. That's a problem. So Allah tells us in the Quran, وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِصَاصِ And for you, for you, in legal retribution, haya is life. And alhamdulillah, you can see that. You can see that... Uh, you know, it's not the case that people in Muslim lands, everybody is righteous and pious. No, even the people who are not pious, they got sense. <laughs> they got some intelligence. They know there's certain things you better not do. They're gonna be, there's going to be consequences. 
All right, so this narration has a foundation with respect to the issue of spilling blood. The blood of a Muslim is prohibited except in the three mentioned offenses. And we already mentioned the qualifying disclaimer that this is the legal punishments are carried out by the Islamic courts, the authorities of the Muslims, not just by anyone and everyone. A life for a life. Someone comes and kill your son, your husband, your daughter. In Islam, we have al-qisas, we have retribution. The family can request from the authority that that person be capital punishment, that we don't want it, we, we want him to be dealt with. Or they can ask for what? Diya, blood money, right? Or they can pardon, they can forgive, they can forgive him. They can forgive him. So a life for a life. And the third one here is, as the Prophet ﷺ said, At-tariku li dinihi, the one who abandons his deen. Huh? Al-mufariku lil jama'ah, the one who splits from the jama'ah. This is similar to a hadith in Bukhari wherein the Prophet ﷺ said, Man baddala deenahu faqtulu. Whoever changes his religion, meaning apostates, faqtulu. Yani, spare him, yani, get rid of him. This is the punishment. Some people say, well, how do we understand that? In the verse in the Quran where Allah says, La ikraha fid deen, there's no compulsion in religion. How do we understand that verse and this hadith? Then we say, La ikraha fid deen means what? You can't compel someone to become Muslim. You can't put a gun in someone's head and say, hey, become Muslim. You can't do that. Right? However, as for the person who is Muslim, and again, in the Muslim lands, in the lands of the Muslim, not in the lands of disbelief, where we don't have, you know, an organized uh, Islamic authority, in the lands of the Muslims, this is something that uh, can and should be uh, carried out. Why? So that people don't play with the religion. That religion doesn't become something that you play with. It's not a game. This is not a joke. Right? Very, very serious matter. And from the maqasid, from the objections, from the objectives of the sharia is what? Hivdudin, preservation of the religion. So therefore, this uh, was legislated. Now, we can give an example of this to put it in perspective. Is anyone obligated to come to the United States of America? No. But if you come, can they make you comply with the law? Yes. Same concept. We're not, we don't make no one become Muslim, but when you become Muslim and you're in the land of the Muslim, you're going to adhere to uh, the rules. And if not, then those things will be in force. The issue of the spilling of the blood is very, very serious. It's not a light matter. Not only is it serious to spill the blood of a Muslim, kill a Muslim, but also point in a weapon at a Muslim. Right? Now, one may say, oh, well, you're saying Muslim, so does that mean we can... Point the weapon at the kuffar? No, that's not what we're saying here either. Right? Uh, there are different types of kuffar. They have, we have different names for them in the sharia. We have something called a mu'ahad, someone who has a pact, right? A covenant with the Muslims. We have something called dhimmi. Dhimmi is someone who is a non-Muslim who lives in the lands of the Muslim, right? Then there are those who have, uh, uh, I mean, there are various different uh, categories of people. It's not allowed for Muslim to just go along, go around killing people, harming people, taking the people's wealth. This is something that Islam has prohibited. However, the issue of the blood of a Muslim is the subject of this hadith. Hada amrun azim. This is a big issue. Big issue. Taking the life of a Muslim. Those who separate themselves from the jama'ah are those who revolt against the leader of the Muslims and those who seek to harm the Muslims and their unity. So the khawarij, for example, when they revolted against Ali, Ali radiallahu an, he waged war against them. Right? Allah says in Surah Al-Hujurat, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا if two groups, if two factions of the believers fight each other, بَيْنَهُمَا Then make reconciliation between the two of them. And then he said what? فَإِنْبَغَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا عَلَى الْأُخْرَى But if one of them transgresses against the other, فَقَاتِلُوا الَّتِي تَبْغِي 
Then all of you fight the one who is transgressing until they return back to the affair of Allah. And then Allah said, and if they come back to the affair of Allah, then yani, alhamdulillah. Yani, فَأَصْلِحُ بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ Make reconciliation between your two brothers. This hadith is important. This ayat is important because it helps us to understand the hadith of the Prophet when he says, سِبَابُ Muslim, fusuk. To curse a Muslim is fusuk. Yani, it's sin, it's transgression. And then he said, وَكِتَالُهُ kufr, And fighting him is kufr. Disbelief. The khawarij, they say, Based on this hadith, anyone who fights another Muslim is a kafir. But Allah said in the verse, if two groups of the believers, what? Fight each other, then reconcile between the two of them. We learn from that what? What we know about kufr. Just like shirk, we have something called kufr al-akbar and we have kufr al-asghar. The big kufr, the major, and we have what's called the lesser. I don't like to say the minor, because there's nothing minor about kufr and there's nothing minor about shirk. I think, wallahu alam, a better translation is the lesser. Why? Because the big kufr take you out of Islam. The lesser kufr is still a major sin, but a person is still a Muslim, just like someone who swears by other than Allah. He doesn't become a kafir necessarily, even though that act is an act of kufr. Man halafa bi ghayrillah, yeah, whoever makes halaf, whoever makes an oath, swears by other than Allah, he has committed kufr or uh, committed shirk. So this is important to understand. Again, this hadith is speaking about the blood, the issue of the blood, spilling the blood. This is not a light matter. This is not a light matter. A friend of mine years ago, there was a brother uh, in the States. He, he, was, he was from Bangladesh, a brother named Khalil. Nice brother. He was one of the brothers who helped start the Huda newspaper. Anyone who who been on the Sunnah and been in America for at least 25 years, you know what the Huda newspaper is. It was one of the first newspapers put together by the people of Sunnah in the United States. And it was printed in Queens. This brother Khalil was a cab driver. And unfortunately, another Muslim stabbed him to death over a parking spot. Killed that brother. May Allah have mercy on him. Over a parking spot. <laughs> Subhanallah. How are you going to stand before Allah on the day of Yom Al-Qiyamah and, 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 and answer about that? Right? Uh, the issue of spilling the blood is not light. It should be taken very seriously. Pointing a weapon at another person, a Muslim, to be taken very, very seriously. This narration obliges the Muslim to guard his or her honor. Legal punishments provide safety and security for the society. This, this narration emphasizes the gravity of murdering a Muslim without right. Of murdering a Muslim without right. And this, this narration also obliges Muslims to unite around the jama'ah. What we see today, inshallah, tonight is going to be not a long class, inshallah. What we see today with many of the Muslims is very disheartening and very saddening, and that is the splitting into sects, splitting into groups, and everyone having his own jama'ah, everyone doing his own thing. And this thing has gotten so distasteful, even when it comes to the issue of masajid. Uh, people are splitting. Sometimes there's no differences even in the aqidah. They're just splitting because of dunya. As one brother said, you want to be rich? Just open a masjid. Open a masjid. You get rich. That's what people are doing now. They're moving like Christians. Christians got churches all over the place. You know, they get rich, taking the people's money without right. It's not permissible for Muslims to be divided and separated. There's a long hadith in Sahih Muslim on authority of Hudayfa where he, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam foretold that a time will come in which the Muslims will not have an imam. And they said, O Messenger of Allah, what should we do when we don't have an imam? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, 
He said, well, first he said, hold on to the, the, the jama'ah and the imam of the Muslims. And then he said, what if there is uh, no imam? He said, then abandon all those sects. All of those firaq, all those sects. It's not permissible for Muslims to be divided. The brother in the, mashallah, in the salah today was reciting from Surah Ali Imran. وَعَتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا Hold fast uh, to the rope of Allah جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا And don't be divided. The scholar said this is an example of tawkid. Allah made tawkid four different ways in this verse. وَعَتَسِمُوا This is an order to a group of people. وَعَتَسِمُوا Hold fast. وَعَتَسِمُوا To what? بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ To the rope of Allah. The rope of Allah is one. Jami'an. That, so that, uh, bihablillah, that's number two. Jami'an, number three of Tawqib. All together. And then he said, Wala tafarraku. And don't be divided. Don't be separated. It's not allowed for Muslims to be in jama'at. You know, and, and all this. Muslims are supposed to come together upon what? The kitab and the sunnah. That's the criteria. Right? We don't say just come together for the sake of coming together as one jama'ah does. This is the Ikhwan al-Muslimun. They're known notorious for this. They accept everybody. They don't care who you are. Shi'i, Sufi, whoever. Let's, and even they have, a, they have a saying. They say, let's work together with what we agree upon and let's remain silent with what we differ about. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is the Muslims are supposed to come together. They're supposed to unite. They're supposed to make ta'awun together based upon the haq, the kitab and the sunnah. You know, I was happy when we heard about the masjid opening in, in Niagara Falls, mashallah. Brothers in Niagara Falls opened the masjid and, and look what we do there, mashallah. The imam, he go there one Friday. Nu'man go there one Friday. I, I've been asked to go there one Friday. You know, we working together. Why? Because we all upon Quran and Sunnah. We're trying to adhere to Quran and Sunnah. This is how masajid should be. There's 54 masjids in Buffalo. 54. <laughs> no exaggeration. There's 54 not including the new ones that's open. I'm telling you, they're opening. It's like they, everyone's opening a masjid. <laughs> I don't like the way you looked at me. I'm going to open my own masjid. I don't like what time y'all do Fajr. I'm going to open my own masjid. This is ridiculous, right? Everyone's opening a masjid. But even if we have different, uh, you know, different masajid, it's permissible to open different masajid provided there's a need to do so. As Ibn Uthaymeen, rahmatullah alayhi, he said, to open a masjid in close proximity to a pre-existing masjid that's upon Quran, that's upon Sunnah, and you want to go open and do your own thing? This is tafriq. This is dividing. This is separating the Muslims. And this is this is this is wrong. Because you can't have the mic because you don't they the people don't they they on to you and now you going to do your own thing? This is wrong. That's not from Islam. There's a masjid that was built during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet was out on one of his battles and he came back and there was this masjid built. And it was built by munafikun, hypocrites. This masjid is called what? Al Dirar. Allah called it Masjid Dirar. And he's and, and Allah said about that masjid, don't pray in that masjid ever. That's what he told the Prophet. Don't pray in that masjid ever. The scholars they talked about what is the meaning of Masjid Dirar? Any masjid that is open with the intent to cause division amongst the Muslim, that's Masjid Dirar. So this hadith, especially the latter part of this hadith, is an encouragement for the Muslims to be with the jama'ah. Stick with the jama'ah. The person who's alone by himself, he's fair, easy prey for the shaitan. The wolf goes after the sheep that strays away from the flock. As for the, 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 the sheep that is with the jama'ah, the wolf has a harder time getting to that sheep. And that's how we need to be. We all should be working together, loving each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, learning the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, helping. Maybe it could be the case that one masjid, they don't have the imam right now and they need help. When we have the ability to help, we help them out. Why? Because we are on the Quran and Sunnah and we're working together and we're moving in the same direction. That's what we're supposed to be doing. 
As for hating each other, disliking each other, trying to quote unquote steal people. <laughs> you guys, there are people literally, hey, hey, you, you don't need to go to that message. Come over here to my message. Yeah, we're going to take good care of you over here. Huh? We're going to, we got, huh? We have biryani. We have chicken biryani over here. Our food is better than theirs. <laughs> Allah must time. Are there any questions about this hadith, uh, what we said tonight or last week? For those of you who are following the Masjid's uh, Facebook page, you'll notice that sometimes if a, if a class, uh, if I mention some ayat or some points in the class and I didn't put it in the handout, I went to the page and I posted those points on the page so you can go there. So for those of you who are following, that's something you can uh, look at, inshallah. Um, this is Hadith 14. You figure we have less, we have about 40 days or 39 days left before Ramadan. The goal is, inshallah, we're going to keep doing every Thursday, but when Ramadan comes, we're going to break. We're not going to, we're not going to do it because Ramadan, we have our own, everyone's doing something and uh, the masjid is going to have, be very busy, have its own program. So we will, we will break. For Ramadan and after Ramadan we will resume inshallah But that means that inshallah between now and Ramadan We should be able to finish at least four or five more hadith We should be able to at least get to hadith number 20 inshallah Alright Any questions so far? What about our sheikh? You have any question or anything you want to add? Barakallahu feek Mm. Yes, he shared with us the some of the ayat from Surah Al Mu'minun. Allah said, "Wa ladina hum li furujihim hafidun," and those who guard those who guards their private parts, ah, uh, illa ala azwajihim, except from their wives, oh ma malakat aymanum, or from what their right hands possess, meaning their slaves. Yes. Yes, Muslims should be in a habit of doing a lot of istighfar, asking Allah's forgiveness. Our Prophet Sallallahu used to ask Allah for forgiveness. And we spoke about zina. What I didn't say about zina is zina has different types and different levels. There is the zina of the eye. There is the zina of the ears. There's the zina even of the hands. And there's the zina of the feet. Right? So a Muslim has to be uh, aware of that. Uh, we, t we said before, we mentioned the ayat, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina. Allah said, and don't come near to zina. Anything that's going to make it easy or facilitate you falling into that, you stay away from it. Whether it's shaking hands, hugging, being alone, the Prophet said, لا يخلوان رجل بامرأة Never is a man and a woman alone إلا except الشيطان ثالثهما The shaytan is the third of them. Right? وَلَيْكُمْ سَلَامْ تَلَّهُ That means what? You go to a brother's house. You knock on the door. His wife answers. Brother Abdullah is not here right now. Okay. Assalamu alaikum and keep it moving. We don't sit. How you doing? What's going on? Oh, mashallah, the children. I saw them at the mesh the other day. Same thing, you call the house. Salaam alaikum. She pick up. Wa alaikum salam. These days, it's not a big problem because we use cell phones. Many people don't have landlines. But, you know, for those of us who remember the landlines, you call the house, the wife pick up, right? Islam teaches her what? As Allah mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, let her not put what softness in her voice. Straight to the point. Salaam alaikum. Ah, Bashir is not here. May I take a message? Okay, salaam alaikum. Not, Assalamu alaikum. MashaAllah, how's your wife? How's your, when you're going to come back to our house? We look forward to having you. Islam, no. Discourages all that stuff. Islam discourages all that stuff. You know? Um, very, very important. Even when you go to the brother's house from the sunnah, from the adab, when you knock at the door, you what? You don't stand facing the door. You turn your body so that if what the door opens maybe the wife is in the background the daughter is in the background you don't see anything you're not supposed to see the family doesn't want you to see you go in someone's house 
You don't sit where you want to sit. You let them tell you where to sit. Maybe this couch is facing the direction of the kitchen. So you sit over here and, and the host will tell you, Tafaddal, sit here, brother. All that is from the etiquettes Islam put in place. Huh? When you go to someone's home, right? And so on and so forth. Why? To avoid fitna, to close the door. Even the Prophet's masjid. You have some Muslims today who say, oh, if our hearts are pure, our hearts are pure, right? And the, and the day of Eid, men and women intermingling with each other. I say, yeah, yeah, ikhwan, you guys are talking about this, but alhamdulillah, yani, our hearts is pure. We ask them, is your heart more pure than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Is your heart more pure than the Sahaba? Why is it that, and as, a, as occurs in the Hadith, Sunan Nabi Dawood, the Prophet's Masjid, they have a door for the women and a door for the men. Why is it that the women are praying in the back and not in the front? Are your, is your heart more pure than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi No. So what are you talking about, man? <laughs> and the believer doesn't say something like that. My heart is pure. Who amongst us can say that? Wala tazakku anfusahum. Don't pray. Don't give tazkiyah to yourselves. You know? Yusuf Alayhi Salam is a Nabi. And yet he what? He sought refuge with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala from the fitna of Nisa. The Prophet Sallallahu said, مَا تَرَكْتُ فِتْنَةٌ بَعْدِ أَدَرْ عَلَى الرِّجَالِ مِنَ النِّسَاء I have not left a greater fitna upon the men. Meaning after him, after his death, I have not left any greater fitna that is greater upon the men than that of Nisa, women. Right? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, when a woman exits the home, the shaitan beautifies her. Right? He beautifies her. Therefore, what? The sister, she does what? When she leaves the home, she should put on the proper Islamic jilbab. Whether she's coming to the masjid or she's going to the grocery store, cover properly, making sure it's not transparent, making sure it's not tight, making sure she don't got on makeup and perfume. And that, and by the way, is a reminder for us brothers, your wife, your daughter, your mother. The Salaf, they used to say that shyness died in women when ghira died in men. If a man have ghira for his wife, he would never let his wife leave the house dressed any kind of way. Hey, where are you going? What you doing? No, no, let's put something more on. Yeah, I smell perfume. No, no, no. Why? You have to have ghira for your family. You see people in the in the stores, Hala with the wife. He's very strict on the, the meat have to be zabiha. Have to be zabiha, but he allowed this other meat with him be exposed for everyone to see. <laughs> No, brother, have ghira for your teach your wife, teach your children. The proper Islamic hijab. You brothers know very well in some of the Muslim countries, even when I went to Pakistan, I saw it's very common there for the women to wear the hijab and the it's going up like this. So the front of the hair is seen and the sides and no, this is Islamically incorrect. Even if you're in America, even here, you have to still cover properly. You have a question, brother? No, you talk to them, you just, uh, to the, يعني, الله ما استطعتم, fear Allah as much as you are able to. I work in a place where my boss is a woman. And my boss, my boss, my boss for the last, for the last eight years, I have, oh, actually, no, ten years, I've had a female uh, boss. I have to, you know, hello, good morning, boss. I got to check with her. I got to, you know, email, call, go to her office. You fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as you are able to, even with the shaking of the hand. A lot of times when you don't shake the woman's hand here in America, they get offended. Why? Because they don't know why you don't shake their hand. They think, because they've been told, the media has told them, that we look at women like they're germs or something. <laughs> you know, she's a germ. Oh my gosh. Oh no, I can't touch. No, that's not the reason. You just simply explain it. You pull them to the side. You say, I want to let you know something. Like, for example, I left... Uh, when I, I just recently, two year, about two years ago, I transferred from one facility to a new facility. My boss was a female. So I told her, I said, listen, there's going to be a new imam. He's going to come here. And I just want to make you aware of something. He might not be so comfortable when it comes to being in your office with the door closed and things like this. 
Me, I've been in my, my boss's office and maybe they, we're talking about something very, very important because of the climate, the climate, the person, and maybe the door, we have to close it to us. But I don't, I'm not in her face. I'm not, you know. So you let them know and you educate them. I told one lady, one lady, uh, she said, you know, can I ask you a question? Why is it that Muslim men don't shake uh, the women's hand? You know, like, what's up with that? And I said, you ever heard of Queen Elizabeth? She said, yeah. I said, you know, there's only 12 people in the whole world that can touch her. Only 12 people. She said, I didn't know that. I said, yeah, we, we treat women like queens. <laughs> we treat the women like queens. We treat them like queens. We don't we, we respect you, actually. Not look down on you. We don't see you as germs. We treat the women like queens. You know, if you're not a, a woman's husband, you're not her son, you're not her nephew, you're not her father, you're not her brother, then there's no need to be hugging on her, shaking her hand, being alone with her, traveling alone with her. No, we don't do that. Look at in any job now. Look at every year we got to get sexual harassment training. Why is that? It's mandatory. Oh, it's if, if the state doesn't send out that reminder and require that people take that training and something goes down, they can be sued. It's a liability. They they deal with this issue. Hmm? Well, the teachers have to have it because of inappropriate relationship with the students. Yeah. Any other question? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, forgive us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make these sittings of benefit. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and make us guides for others. Remember something, brothers, sitting in this class, this is not just for you. Initially, it's for you, but it's for your family, and this is for the people in your society around you. You will never know when a loss, when when you will be put in a situation where you will need to use what you are learning. So remember, as the Imam constantly reminds the brothers to take notes, you got to take notes because if you don't take notes, I'm guarantee you, there's a lot of things you will not remember. Even the hufaz, the big hufaz. If you study ilm al hadith, they tell you in some cases. They would get old and their memories would become poor. And the only way they would be able, the only way you could rely on his hadith if, it's, if he's what? Narrating from what he wrote. You know, we'd like that. <laughs> we not, we don't, and most of us don't even have the memories today like those people did before. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Shadu wa la ilaha ila anta stuck.